I'm Benjamin, the intrepid and self-effacing and humble participant in today's um, conversation. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our next conversation with Dr. Jana Reese and Dr. Benjamin Knoll, we're going to talk about young and old attitudes about church teachings and practices. In our next conversation, we'll find out how similar they are or how different they are. Are millennials really changing the church? We'll find out more in our next conversation with Jana and Ben. You're not going to want to miss it. Hey, also, I'm going to be giving away a book uh, in our final segment with Jenna and Ben, The Next Mormons, which is a fantastic book, by the way. You should buy it. But if you want one for free, sign up for our newsletter at gospeltangents.com newsletter. If you're already a newsletter subscriber, which is free, by the way, you'll, um, you don't need to enter again. You'll already be entered. But I'm going to be giving this away to one of my... Uh, newsletter subscribers. So please sign up at gospeltangents.com slash newsletter if you'd like a copy of this fantastic book. Now back to our conversation. I, I almost don't want to ask this question, but I ha- I feel like I have to. Because one of the other interesting surprises on me uh, was was porn use. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Were you surprised that it was high or that it was low? Because I've actually gotten both of those responses. Um, the well, the, the, I guess the surprising thing for me was the uh, female use of porn. Mm. Uh, because, you know, it's always the men that are hammered quit watching porn. Yeah. Um, but it sounded like the women watch it at much higher rates. And no, no. Uh, no. Is that, that's not <laughs> no, true? For, for men, it's actually twice what it is for women. But for younger women... But it's, it was higher than, than we thought for women, wasn't it? Well, it... it I mean, I in know. that case, you're comparing it to zero because, in, it, it, you know, if you have the discourse of Mormon culture, that's a problem that has not existed until about two years ago. The church did just update its website on pornography last year and has included some stories of women, which may be for the first time in, in kind of church official discourse that they're recognizing this is actually a thing. And it's not just that women are suffering because their husbands are using pornography or their sons or their fathers. So that, that is different. But it is, first of all, uh, considerably lower than the national population for both women and men in terms of, of consumption of pornography. And it's also significantly lower for women than it is for men, which is the case nationally as well. Yeah, well, I would expect that women would, would I don't know if consume is the right word, but uh, <laughs> would use porn less than men. But it was still, it was higher than I, you know, you, you always, and I guess maybe you always think, oh, women don't watch porn. But I think... At least in the research that I thought, I, I thought that it was it was higher than I would have expected. Mm, okay, let's look up those numbers um, so that we know what we are talking about. Particularly, talk amongst yourselves. Okay, while I <laughs> so take that up. Um, what, so you did say that it was less among men. Do we? You know, we talked a little bit about desirable traits. Is this a? Do we have any idea if? Uh, it's underreported because it wouldn't be socially desirable to say, hey, I like porn. No, that's a really good question mm-hmm. there. It is. I, I don't think from the survey we have any firm evidence to be able to say it's being over or underreported at this rate, whatever. But we can make a good guess based on other research that's been done and um, sociology or, um, types of studies that look at overreporting and things like this that consistently say this is a really hard thing to measure because of the social desirability aspect of it. And so it's often the case that it's very underreported. People are saying it at much lower rates than is actually the case. So I don't have a good reason to suspect that it would be otherwise for our survey. So based on this, the actual rates are probably higher. That's the best guess. I well, could you know, make. anecdotally, when I showed this, uh, these initial findings to Jennifer Finlayson Fife, who is a sex therapist and has a doctorate in this, she basically laughed out loud, like, you know, this is too low. This is there is some self-reporting issue here because, okay. and of course, you know, she would be the first to acknowledge that the people that she sees in her office are people who feel that they have a problem with some aspect of sexuality. So that in itself is not a reliable statistical sample either. Could, yeah, she but, could be. She could have uh, selection bias in her study. Right. Too, exactly. That, that right. Um, but let me just tell you what the numbers are for explicit pornography, which we allowed them to define for themselves. 
we had 16.4% of men and 7.5% of women saying they had seen that in the last six months. For uh, men and women with soft pornography, which again, we allowed them to define that for themselves, 20.7% of men and 7.7% of women. So these are actually quite low numbers in comparison with the general population, but they are higher numbers, uh, particularly for younger men and women than I think Mormon leaders would like to see. Okay. And um, have, have leaders, have LDS leaders looked at your data and, and uh, have, you, have you spoken with some leaders about this sort of thing? Yes and no. I think when this question has been asked before and what people tend to mean is the brethren or the quorum of the 12 and of that I have no idea if anyone has read it or even knows about it but that's not why we wrote this book you know that's not why we did this project but it is very interesting to hear from local leaders and we've heard from quite a few actually about our data and um, how people are, are actually bringing the book to bishopric meetings and talking about it in stake high council talking about it in relief society talking about it with young single adults and that has been very encouraging i think for, forearmed is forewarned right is or is that the other way around <laughs> information is good is uh -huh. what i'm trying to say and the more information that we can have about what's going on with particularly with young adults in the church and trying to understand the reasons why more appear to be leaving, the better. Okay. Um, I know you, the book's called The Next Mormons. How are, and we talked, I know you talked about baby boomers, millennials, Gen Xers, and the silent generation, if I get it right. Uh, can you briefly give us an, a, a breakdown of what are, what's the rough ages of those people and then I'll, I'll give that question to you. And then how are the um, how are the millennials different than everybody else? So with this, again, uh, we looked to people who have done a lot of prior research on this. The Pew Research Center has done extensive research on generational change in America. And so we basically took their definition of who counts as each of the generational categories. Um, and with this one, they're defining millennials as people born between 1981, We right? had, I believe, 1980 to 1998. Okay. But we 1980 have, to 1998. Um, here's the chart. Oh, beautiful. Here we go. So, yes, the you millennials... You can tell Ben is an actual millennial because he doesn't need <laughs> reading glasses to read the chart. <laughs> it's true. And up until very recently, I was a fellow millennial with my college students, but we've now, <laughs> <laughs> we've now aged out of that, yep. So yes, millennials are defined as those who were born between 1980 and 1998. So at the time of the survey, age 18 to 36. Okay. And this was in 2016 when this happened, so they'd be a couple years older now. Um, Gen Xers are those who were born between 65 and 79, who then were between 37 and 51 at the time of the survey. Uh, baby boomers between 45 and 64, who were 52 to 71, and then the silent generation born between 1928 and 1944, who were 72 to 88 at the time that this was done. And yeah, so that's what we had for the survey and putting that together. Um, because of response rates amongst olders, because this is a internet-based survey, and a, we were talking about before how it achieved representativeness on a whole lot of demographic indicators, age was one that we struggled with, uh, simply because people who are more likely to take online surveys tend to be younger. And that worked out well in some ways because we wanted to focus the book on, on younger um, members of the church. But for older members, um, we had to do some, like specifically, uh, the survey firm went out and said we're deliberately trying to get more older members in here. So we were able to bring that up almost to parallel with what the Pew Research had. But that's another one where we had to put some of that waiting on afterwards um, to be able to make the pictures for the older members look as representative as possible to try to infer as best we could with that. And so oftentimes in the book, combined baby boomers and silent generation into a single category because they tended to look similar on a lot of things, whereas Gen Xers and Millennials tended to look similar on a lot of things. The breakdown seemed to be between the baby boomer and Gen X generation, and the trends that the Millennials show um, were often continuations of things that started or became more pronounced in the Gen X generation, which I thought was really interesting. Well 
All right, so how are the, the Gen Xers and the Millennials? I think the Millennials are even more different, right? How are they more different? Well, they are not quite as politically conservative. They are not flaming liberals by any stroke of the imagination. They're still Mormons, and so they're more conservative than other people their age, but they are less conservative than older Latter-day Saints politically, and I think in terms of their, um, their religiosity, they are, again, in between. So millennials as a whole in the nation are the generation that we're seeing to be most likely to disaffiliate of any generation that we've been tracking in American history. But for millennial Mormons, yes, they are more likely to disaffiliate than their older counterparts, but less likely to do so than other millennials. So just think of them as kind of in the middle of these two things. But they're more supportive of LGBT rights, not as supportive as other millennials. You know? Okay, that's interesting. Um, so, you know, it's a, I know your subtitle there is How Millennials Are Changing the Church. How are they changing the church? Well, this is the church as the people of the church. It's not the church in terms of what's going on exactly in the headquarters of the church that is changing. This is change from the grassroots. And also millennials are the oldest, the vanguard of them, the Bens, are coming into the age where some of them are bishops and some of them are Relief Society presidents, even outside of kind of young single adult ward Relief Society presidents. And so they're in a position where some of them are changing the church where they live, changing the culture of it. So I don't want to overstate that with the subtitle, but it, there is definitely change afoot okay. because of their needs. Um, I, I'm going to ask this question. So, you know, we've recently had the, the policy reversal. Um, do you think, do you see the church becoming more LGBT friendly because of the millennials? That's a tough question. Um, I had a very interesting conversation a few weeks ago with Greg Prince. I interviewed mm -hmm. him for my blog. I just talked to him this week. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes. So his new book is called Gay Rights in the Mormon Church, and it is a, a pretty extensive history of every aspect of this, this interaction between the LGBT community and uh, the, the LDS Church for decades. And that was very interesting to read the book and to see how much of a process it has been of one step forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And with the policy in particular, the policy was controversial and unpopular right from the start. And I think that second only to Proposition 8 in terms of public outcry and anger directed toward the church about the policy because it seemed so unnecessary to many people. Um, why it was changed, that's a very interesting question that I I'm not in a, you know, that's above my pay grade to answer. I think I was surprised by it when I got the news because President Nelson actually, when he was in the Quorum of the Twelve as an elder, was the person who publicly had, had heralded this as a revelation from God. And so then to have the policy reversed under President Nelson's tenure was, I think, surprising. That was much faster than I would have expected it to happen. No, I agree. Yeah, I was not anticipating that would be the case. So quickly, right. I mean, I yeah. thought it would happen eventually, but I well, was Greg, very surprised that it happened Greg now. said he expected it to go for 15 years, and it went for about three and a half. So Did he say 15? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, he thought that they would double down for about 15 years. And so it was definitely surprising. Um, and, you know, I, and I, I asked Greg a little bit about, you know, how many people left the church. He said in the first year, 60,000 people. Yeah, that's which is just he and I talked about this as well, and uh, we're not finding that kind of evidence. Oh, really? No. Uh, uh, yeah. We yeah. Well, that's one that we're going to have to take a little bit further look at. So this happened. What was it? Two thousand fifteen. Fifteen. November, November. Right, and our survey was literally just the year afterwards. And so for people to say that they're former Mormons in here, that would have been only a year for that to have happened, and there just wasn't that many people in the survey that we saw identifying as a former Mormon who had left just in that 12 months before um, the survey was conducted from when the uh, event uh, first happened there. So it's difficult for us to be able to definitively put a number on that one way or another. Something I was actually planning to look at, we have a, um, 
question in there about people's likelihood to uh, remain a long-term member of the church. So that was something that we asked everyone who identified as LDS, just a straight, like on a scale of one to 10, how confident are you that you will remain a lifelong member, um, active, you know, for the rest of your life? And not surprisingly, like people are very, very strong on that. It's like, yes, of course, like 10 out of 10, nine out of 10, like very few, anything less than seven or eight or so. That said, there were some who were kind of in that middle area there. And again, this is very, very preliminary. I haven't been able to do an extensive look at it, but we also had questions about um, opinions toward the uh, policy change that happened in 2015. And majority of self-identified members of the church approved and said, yes, I support this. Um, but a solid quarter, a third did not. And there is a correlation between the people who said, um, I don't support this and having lower levels of confidence of remaining a lifetime, lifelong member afterwards. And so I still need to take some additional looks in that to just check and make sure that's not like a correlation causation kind of thing. But there's some suggestive evidence that that's a factor that goes in there, but being able to put a precise number on it. Is well, very, and I think what Greg what was saying was that 60,000 people had actually resigned their membership from the church, which, you know, that's proprietary information that's hard for researchers to get at. The church does not reveal how many people have resigned their membership in any given period of time. What we can say, though, which would support this being unpopular in a certain segment of the population, is that... Uh, this ranked third as the third most common reason for leaving among millennial Latter-day Saints. It ranked sixth for Gen Xers who had left the church. was and, not in the top not ten. not the policy itself. Oh, just sorry, rather, not the policy, just yeah. LGBT issues in general. I'm Which sorry, includes good, that, Good yes. qualification there. Right, it includes this but is not limited to it. But LGBT issues were a very important factor for a, a certain percentage of people who left the church, particularly younger people. So... I, I would not at all be surprised to say that this is a factor uh, in, in the church's position on LGBT issues going forward, that they don't want to further alienate younger members. Well, and I guess I do have another question. If you look at 60,000 divided by 15 million, that's a tiny, that's a fraction of a percent, right? And how big was your survey of Mormons? We had 1,156 currently identified and 540 former Mormons. So uh, would your survey even be large enough to ascertain, I mean, 60,000 sounds like a big number, but you know, in my statistics class, I always say rates are much better than counts. Um, mm. And so as, as far as a rate, that would be a tiny fraction. Would you even be able to notice that in a survey of 1,100 people? Um, Matt Martinic, who is much more advanced on church statistics than just about anybody else, uh, would say no, that that's not enough to move the needle, as he would put right. it. That is not enough to move the needle. And uh, his research is very interesting. You can take a look at that online uh, at ldschurchgrowthblogspot.com or kimora.com. And he's looking at it country by country, not like us, just looking at the United States, but looking at Mormon growth around the world and uh, where some of the growth areas are, and then more and more recently where the areas of stagnation or actually decline are happening. Okay. Well, and again, that's a separate, we, we want to emphasize that that's the way we usually are accustomed to thinking about who's a member and who's not, right? Right. Who has the official membership record, have they officially taken it off the list or whatever, which is a similar but not exactly the same way that social scientists are able to get at this. It's all about self-report. So that 15 million number that you mentioned before uh, is much higher than when people would self-report how many of you are actually, like do you identify as a member of the church? It's much, much lower than that. Um, as well as if they're identifying as a former Mormon, they might very well still be on the records and just not care to do anything about that, but just don't own it anymore as an identity. And so that's important to keep in mind those definitions of how we're counting, what does it mean to leave the church, quote unquote. Right. And we're coming from the side of, are you identifying or not anymore, regardless of whatever the church membership record is? Okay, so there could be a difference in definition there. Yes. And I, another thought comes into my head is, are these 60,000 people, people who weren't attending anyway and just said, this is the final straw? We, you, wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't notice that. Although I, I don't think that's the case because you know, I know several people personally that, um, that were active and then 
just threw in the towel and said, I, I can't put up with this anymore. So it, it, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, one thing that brings up is this issue of the, the narratives that we see most visibly about ex-Mormons and then what the statistical probability is about those narratives. And the most common narrative that I think we, we hear in social media and podcasts is the narrative of people who were very active, grew up in the church, served a mission, got married in the temple, and then in their maybe 30s discovered something and left the church, whether it was a social issue that they couldn't reconcile or a historical issue, that they've had this kind of dramatic turnaround. But that's actually not the statistical norm, which is that you leave in adolescence, you leave much earlier. The people whose names are on the rolls of the church that you never heard of, you know, that, that, that are still on the rolls, that's actually the more statistically likely scenario for leaving the church than the I was all in as a member. That's not to say that those stories don't happen because they absolutely do. And if I were a leader of the church, I would be particularly concerned about those stories because those were the active people and the tithe payers and the mission goers, but they are not actually the majority. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Reese and Dr. Knoll. You know, church growth has slowed recently in the past decade or so. I asked Jana specifically if there was anything the church could do to restart that growth. In the 1950s and 60s, when religion uh, was thriving in the United States, we were also thriving. And in the 70s and 80s, when conservative religions in particular were thriving in the United States, we were thriving. And now we're in a period where everyone is suffering. We are also suffering. So in that context, particularly because we are less than 2% of the population, there's not a lot we can do. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview and you can also get uh, transcripts available in either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button of course we're also on Facebook Twitter and all the other places uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents and don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.